have you ever been in a situation where you said something and the way that you said it, the person that heard it, heard it differently? Right? Quick raise of hands if you say, yes, I've been there before, right? Yeah, you've been there before. Uh, what you'll learn the longer you live is that how you say what you say matters. How you say what you say matters matters. Um, I learned this uh, recently and was reminded of this truth uh, on a trip that my family and I took uh, together. Uh, every summer, Stacey and I take our kids away for some extended time and for an extended break. And uh, like many families, we like to collect souvenirs, uh, except the souvenirs that we collect are terrible travel experiences. Uh, and if you've been around Nona before, you know that that is the case. And this trip was no different. In fact, it was great until our way back home. We had a two-day travel itinerary uh, that involved three flights and about a two-and-a-half-hour drive to get back home to Orlando. And we, having learned over time how important it is to have a margin when you're traveling with kids, decided to give ourselves a four-hour window to get a regional flight from Frankfurt, Germany to Dublin, Ireland so that we can make our way home. Well, we arrive at the airport uh, four hours before our flight is supposed to take off, and everything bad that could happen did happen, all right? Uh, we go to drop off our car rental, only to find out as we pull in to drop it off with a handwritten note on a piece of paper uh, in German that the car rental company for this location is closed. And so we got in the car and we drove further away to drop off our car. It took us uh, about 35 minutes to find that place. After we went through that process, we then ran into a situation where the gentleman taking our car in uh, wanted to charge me an additional $300 for a crack that he noticed on a windshield. And we got into a little bit of a dispute. And for legal purposes, I cannot disclose more at this time. After that, uh, it takes us 20 minutes to find the bus that's going to take us to our terminal. After we get to the terminal, we find ourselves in a line of a few hundred people that are waiting to check their bags in because there are two people working the counter for our flight. And here's what blows my mind. We didn't have any checked bags. We had carry-on bags. But for this airline, you have to check on your carry-on bag. When we get to the family boarding area for passport control, the family in front of us gets to go through, and then it's our turn to go. And the gentleman looks at me and says, this uh, lane is now closed. You can go to the back of that lane. And we found ourselves four hours early for a flight, sprinting through passport control, only to find out that there is more security we did not know about as our plane was boarding. It was very stressful in this environment because we had a couple thousand dollars of non-refundable tickets on the other side of this flight, and there wasn't another option. Anybody like travel sounds like a terrible thing to do with the Outerbridge family. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It is. I thought that I was doing a spectacular job as a parent. I was saying things like, hey, guys, don't worry. Everything's going to be okay. Hey, if we miss our flight, it's not that big of a deal. We'll just get a flight tomorrow. Hey, everything's going to be just fine. As we get to the gate, uh, I sit down, and my oldest daughter comes and she sits down next to me. And she offers me some constructive feedback. Now, you need to know something about our family and our home. We're all about feedback. We think that all feedback can be good feedback. The only rule of thumb is that it needs to be appropriately respectful and it needs to be done in private. And so my oldest took this opportunity to provide me constructive feedback as the flight was boarding. And she said, Dad, I think you need to evaluate on this flight. 
whether or not your tone was appropriate in the way that you spoke to us because you increased the anxiety that all of us felt. You did not help the situation. You hurt it. And I think that you have some responsibility to take for the attitude that you had with your family. Everyone is stressed out because you stressed us out. And it's not like we were going to lose that much if we didn't make the flight, Dad. You made this a way bigger deal than it should have been. And the first thing that I thought as she was giving me this very respectful feedback was, I cannot wait until you are a parent with kids and I get to watch you try to parent your kids because I'm going to sit you down and give you constructive feedback. Like, that's the thing I was thinking. Which probably betrayed the fact that I probably had a little bit of work to do on my own. See, I thought that I was handling it well. Guys, everything's going to be okay. But my daughter was telling me that although the words coming out of my mouth seemed to be helpful, the tone that I took was telling. And today I want to talk about that, our tone, because our tone can be telling. It's why I love that our series is titled Kids These Days, because the way you say the phrase kids these days is telling, isn't it? I mean, some of us, when we hear the phrase kids these days, we would say, oh, kids these days. That all they do is scroll on a screen. All they do is spend time on social media. Kids these days. All they do is know how to complain. Kids these days. What's up with their fashion? What, why do we have low-cut jeans again? Do you know how hard we worked to get rid of low-cut jeans? Why is it that whenever I go to a store, I can't find a shirt now? They're all crop tops. Ah, kids these days. Or the tone that we could take would be kids these days. Wow. And Malala Yousafzai, what an amazing young woman who's pioneered education for vulnerable women and teens around the world. Wow, kids these days. Kavya Koparupu, she's 20 years old and she found a way to diagnose brain cancer and opened up a patent and now has a nonprofit that helps make sure that kids have access to great uh, computer opportunities to learn more about IT and, and the ways that computers work. Or wow, kids these days. Rachel Sumick, what an amazing person who in college developed an app and a nonprofit called Swipe Out Hunger that's helped 300,000 people get access to food that they otherwise would not have been able to get. When I say the phrase kids these days, what tone do you tend to think about it? Is it, ah, kids these days? Or is it, wow, kids these days? See, your tone, <laughs> your tone is telling. Would you turn to somebody and say that really quickly? Say, your tone is telling. Turn to somebody else and say, your tone is telling. Because here's what I know, here's what I know about all of us. That all of us at some point in our life, we were kids. And the decisions we made and the clothes we wore and the music that we listened to, it made sense to us, didn't it? But here's what we also know, is that kids these days, they've got a lot in front of them. The kids these days are facing unique challenges and difficult roads ahead. And we know that. Because 78% of young people in a recent poll indicated that they feel lonely and isolated. 50% of children will grow up in a home that's marked by di divorce. And 21% of kids will never have a relationship with a father figure in their life. And what we want to do over the next couple of weeks is we want, to, we want to get a grasp of what Jesus' tone was to kids those days so that we can learn how to follow him in serving kids these days. And, and I hope that this series is really helpful and really practical for everybody in the room. If you're a parent or a grandparent or an uncle or an aunt, my hope is that over the next couple of weeks, you get tools and resources that help you guide and care for the young people in your life. 
not in the world that we wish it was, but in the world that is existing today. If you have any child in your life, any child that's around you, you want to be a part of this conversation. And if you find yourself, maybe as a millennial or Gen Z, or find yourself as a young adult in our church, my hope is that over the next couple of weeks, you would get a better understanding of just how passionate we are in pouring into your lives because we believe God has amazing things planned for you and there should be no better place for you to explore your faith or grow in your faith than in the local church. And we're about that. And maybe you find yourself almost checking out now because you're like, I'm, I'm not a parent or this series doesn't seem like it's connected to me. I need you to hear this. This is not a parenting series. This is a church series and an everybody series for a couple of reasons. Because at the very least, if you find yourself saying, Colin, I do not like kids these days. And I will not like kids in those days. I will never like kids in any day. If that's where you find yourself, I want you to understand I get that. But you've got to lean in and acknowledge that kids these days are going to become adults one day. And the kids these days will one day be the ones that are providing your health care. They'll be the ones making policy that determine how much you pay in taxes. They'll be the ones leading the organizations and businesses that you still find yourself working for. And the important thing for all of us to get today is that what happens in the next generation has a profound impact on what will happen to us as well. We should care about kids these days. So today, to set up our series and our conversation, I just want to ask you this question. What is your tone towards kids these days? Maybe you find yourself hopeful and excited and passionate about what the future might look like. Or perhaps you find yourself confused and scared and concerned about what the future might look like for kids these days. And regardless of where you find yourself, I've got good news for you is that you will find yourself in good company. Because what we find is both of these perspectives exist in the New Testament stories that Jesus has when it comes to kids. And yet Jesus has a tone. Jesus has an approach to kids these days that I think is the best way forward for all of us. So if you have a Bible, turn with me in Matthew chapter 19. That's where we're going to study today. Matthew chapter 19, verses 13 through 15. And what we'll find in this text is how Jesus invites all of us to respond to kids these days. In Matthew chapter 19, it says this. We'll start actually in verse 1. In verse 1. And it came to pass when Jesus finished these words that he went away from Galilee and came into the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And great crowds followed him and he healed them there. Now, we're going to be looking at verses 13 through 15 today, but I wanted to start in verses 1 and 2 because I want us to capture and understand the setting and the environment in which Jesus is going to give us words of counsel today. Jesus finds himself surrounded by crowds. In fact, Matthew, in his New Testament gospel, goes out of his way over and over and over again to remind us that Jesus' ministry was large, it was big, it was impactful, and everywhere he went, there was a group of people, a significantly large group of people that were around him. There was something that was attractive about Jesus. So Jesus finds himself in the Galilee. He's preaching and teaching. The crowds have gathered. And if you read verses 3 through 12, Jesus talks about marriage and divorce. And as thousands of people are listening to these words, it's like they take a moment, an intermission or a break in the midst of the teaching time. Jesus pauses for a moment. Everybody goes to get a snack. And there's a moment where there's a meet and greet opportunity for people to go and shake the hand of this new rabbi and teacher that everyone seems to be so interested in. If you've ever been to a concert, you know what this is like, right? It's the meet and greet moment. And we find in verse 13 this, that in the meet and greet, people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. And the question becomes, what did the disciples think 
of these kids and young people that were in line to meet Jesus? Well, we find the answer in verse 13. But the disciples rebuked them. And that word rebuke is a harsh word. It means that the disciples who were kind of making sure that things were in order as people were going to meet Jesus identified all of these kids and families that were there and they went to the families and said, you should not be in line. Jesus doesn't have time to meet with you. You should not be here. You're a distraction and you're a disruption. And if we're honest, the disciples' attitude towards kids reflected the perspective of kids those days and in many ways can reflect our perspective towards kids these days. Um, You ever had a moment in your life, maybe as a parent or not a parent, where you've seen a kid acting in a certain way where you thought somebody needs to parent that child? Has anybody been there before? Yes. Have you ever been in a situation where you look at a family who is struggling with their kids and you think, my goodness, whatever parenting method you're working, you need a new one, yeah? Yeah. I remember when Stacy and I uh, were uh, first dating and we would kind of do runs to like Target and stuff like that, we would see parents struggling. Or we would go on a flight. And you guys ever been in that situation where you go on a flight, you've got a toddler kicking you in the back seat, you've got a baby screaming in the front seat, and you think to yourself, surely they should have a flight just for families, right? Like this is not okay. And I remember that the perspective that Stacy and I had oftentimes when we watched parents struggle with their kids before we had kids was, oh my gosh, when we become parents, our kids are never going to act like that. Quick raise of hands if you've ever had that attitude before. Yeah, yeah. And then we became parents. And oftentimes I'm running around a public space with my kids being like, somebody help, anybody help. I'll take any, any help at all, right? Find yourself apologizing before you walk into environments. I'm so sorry, my kid's going to break something. You know, that kind of deal. Well, that, that's the same thing that's true about kids in the first century too. I mean, think about this. This is Jesus, the, the amazing communicator. This is Jesus who gathered thousands around him. Surely the parents should know better than to bring their kids to Jesus. But Jesus' response, his tone towards kids It's different. We find in Matthew chapter 19, verse 14, that Jesus said, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for theirs, the kingdom of heaven, rather, belongs to such as these. I want you to see that Jesus' response is public because there's crowds around. It's clear how his heart is towards kids. And you need to know this. As you read the New Testament documents, it is consistent. Every time Jesus comes across a child, he has the same kind of heart towards that kid. Which leads us to the big idea, which you can take uh, if you're jotting down in your formation journal, or you can do on our new Nona Church app. You can jot down and fill in the blanks for the big idea. It's this, that Jesus elevated and prioritized the faith of the next generation, and he charged his followers to do the same. Now, I want you to look back with me at verse 14, because in a plain reading, you might miss just how significant the words of Jesus are here in this moment. Jesus says, let the little children come to me. But the word that is better used to describe that phrase, let, is not passive. It's not as if Jesus is saying, hey, just just make sure you stay out of the way of kids trying to come to me. The word there is actually used in a tense and in a form that is meant to say, hey, permit or allow. It's like make room for. It's active. A good way to describe it is, hey, make room for, make space for, how I like to say it, make a way for the children to come to me. And then Jesus doubles down. It's a dual command here in verse 14. It's not just make a way for the children to come to me, but it's also do not hinder them. In other words, be a part of making a way for kids to meet me and make sure you don't get in the way of them meeting me. The way that I would describe it is this. When it comes to kids meeting Jesus, Jesus is saying, be sure to make a way And definitely don't get in the way. So the question that I want to process for the next few minutes with you, kind of two quick questions. The first one is this. How can we get in the way of kids these days? And secondly, why does it matter? 
that we all make a way for kids. And I actually want to start with the second question. Because sometimes I think starting with why gives us a better understanding of its importance. So why should we not get in the way? Why should we not contribute? And why should we make a way for kids to be able to follow Jesus? Well, the answer is found back in verse 14, where Jesus says, do not hinder them. And then pay attention to this phrase. He says, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Jesus is looking at the kids and he says, don't get in the way of these kids because the kingdom of heaven actually belongs to them. So obviously, the first reason why we ought not get in the way is pretty, pretty plain and clear, right? The kids need to meet Jesus. And when kids meet Jesus, their lives are changed. And we know that, that most kids who follow Jesus for a lifetime make that decision between the ages of 0 and 14. And that about 80% of them make that decision between the ages of 0 and 18. So how we invest in the next generation is not only important because they need to know Jesus, it's incredibly strategic because if they follow Jesus in their youngest years, they're more likely to follow Jesus as adults. But the second reason, it's a little bit more selfish, if you will. It's, it's a little bit more about you than it is necessarily about kids. You see, Jesus wants us to understand that, that when kids are around us, it's actually important for our own faith formation that we actually, as adults, are inspired and have an imagination for the beauty and the kindness and the goodness of God when kids are more involved in our lives. We know this because in Matthew chapter 18, there's this really interesting story where just a chapter before, if you have your Bible, flip one chapter earlier. Jesus uh, is hanging out with his disciples, and they're having a debate about who's going to have the most power. And they say in Matthew chapter 18, verse 1, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and said, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus, responding, uses an illustration. And his illustration is with a kid. He's called a little child to him and placed a child among them. And he said, truly, I tell you. Unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You see, we gain a different perspective on the same things when we see them through the lens of a child. Is that not true? I mean, when you go to Disney as an adult, like it's enjoyable, right? But when you take a kid who's never been to Disney for the first time, it's a categorically different experience. I experienced this this summer. Uh, this summer, we spent a couple of weeks with my grandparents uh, on the island that I spent all of my summers on, uh, on the island of Bermuda. And it was one of the first times that I got to bring my kids at an age where they could experience the same memories that I had as a child. So we went fishing in the same places that I went fishing. We ate ice cream at the same place that I ate ice cream, and we ate there seven times in 11 days. <laughs> and I wish it was 11 times in 11 days. And one of the really cool things that we got to do is we got to take our kids to this old parish church, this Anglican church that's the oldest church that has had consistent services in North America. It's been around since the 1600s. And we got to worship in that church. And in that same parish just happens to be where my, my family's burial plots are, where we will lay our family to rest. And what's really interesting about old kind of Anglican churches that are, you know, hundreds of years old is that they used to design them where the church was in the middle and then there was a cemetery around it. That's where you got buried. So every single week when you went to church, you'd be reminded, hey, you could be next. Like that's what that was about. And so this is a new cultural experience for my kids, but especially for my youngest. So we took him to, s to show him where the burial plots were, where, where our family might be buried. And he was surrounded by all of these different, you know, headstones as he was going into church. And uh, we got the opportunity after that trip to go to Europe. And when we were in Europe, part of what you do in Europe is you go see a lot of old churches, right? And let's be honest, if you've seen an old church at some point, an old church is an old church is an old church is an old church is an old church, right? They all kind of look the same. And they all got creepy stuff on the, the windows, and you don't know what's going on, right? 
Well, let me tell you, my experience going to old churches was categorically different because I got to see it through the eyes of a child. And my little six-year-old, after spending time at this little Anglican church with the cemetery, would walk into every single church we were in Europe like he was like Sherlock Holmes. And he asked questions like, Dad, are there dead people here too? <laughs> nice and loud for everyone to hear. Yes, there are. And at the same time, we were talking about heaven. And my, my son, he, he saw a, a couple of bricks that had like fallen off in a particular area. And he walked over to the bricks and he's like, Dad, is this where a dead person busted out of their tomb to go to heaven? <laughs> And I said, yes, yes, it, and I, I, I did. <laughs> but he was asking big questions. He was asking questions like, Dad, what happens to our soul when we die? And what is heaven like? And how can I know that, that heaven is going to be for me? And what does it mean that, that God's going to raise us up? Let me tell you, an old church became an incredible experience of getting to see it through the eyes of a kid. And let me tell you, if I don't have young people around me in my life, here's what I've learned, especially as I watch my kids grow up. And this is for everybody in the room. If your faith feels stale and old and boring and you're kind of getting apathetic, I would encourage you to get around some young people. Like get around somebody who's in their 20s. And allow their energy to inspire you. And I think that the best way that the church functions is that those who are older and have wisdom get inspired by the younger ones who have energy and fervor. And those that have energy and fervor get guided by those that have time and wisdom. Too many of us are living a stale, been there, done that faith. Because we have yet to engage our lives in a way that invites the imagination and the energy and the inspiration that comes from being around young people again. And if Jesus didn't prove his point in the first four verses in Matthew 18, he hammers it home in verse 5 when he says, And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes so what I want to do for the rest of my time is answer this question today. How can we get in the way? Well, I think there's three ways we see in the Matthew chapter 19 text that we were studying today. The first one is this, is when we get in the way of kids these days, when we overlook and underestimate them. You see, the disciples are looking at kids being brought to Jesus, and they see them as a distraction and a disruption. They have nothing to offer Jesus. Um, this last week, I was at a conference and there's a particular room that you could only get into if you had a particular pass. And if you had that pass, it was either because you were somebody or you knew somebody who was somebody. And you could not get in unless you had that backstage pass. And in many ways, what we see here in the meet and greet is the disciples are evaluating, hey, what do you have to offer Jesus? And if you don't have anything of value to offer Jesus, you can't get near him. That's human nature, isn't it? And so often we can overlook and underestimate young people, especially, I would say, this generation of teenagers, and miss that God actually wants to do something amazing in them. Here's what I know about Jesus. He says, let the children come to me, make a way and don't get in the way, because Jesus doesn't hand out backstage passes, because Jesus doesn't need anything from anybody. We're all invited to meet him. We're all invited. The second way I think we can get in the way of kids is that we can focus a little too much on behavior modification instead of heart transformation. Now, we miss this in a plain reading of the text, but, but again, join me in remembering what it must have been like to have thousands of people in a crowd, hundreds of families waiting to meet Jesus. I mean, it's loud, it's annoying, it's hot, kids are screaming, kids are messy, kids are smelly, it's like a bad Southwest Airlines flight, and you're not leaving the tarmac. You know what I'm talking about, right? And Jesus' heart is not oriented into the kids being clean and proper and prim before he can meet them. Jesus welcomes messy kids. And that's a good reminder for all of us 
that in the grand scheme of things, no matter how old you are, guess what you are? A kid who's a mess. And thank God that God welcomes us as we are. Not as others might expect us to be. When we have a negative tone towards kids these days, it's often because we want them to change their behavior instead of having the patience that God invites us to have to watch him change their hearts. If you're looking for a really great resource on how to build sticky faith in your kids, we'd recommend a book called Sticky Faith by Kara Powell. She's an expert at the Fuller Youth Institute. And she has this great quote where she says, kids experience Jesus Christ when adults in the church give them grace, time, and genuine love with no hidden agenda. Because you know how we grow? Through God's grace, kindness, and genuine love too. The third way that you and I, that you and I can get in the way of kids meeting Jesus is when we avoid them instead of engage them. See, the spectacular moment in Matthew chapter 19 isn't just in the fact that Jesus verbalized, hey, make a way and don't get in the way, but it's what Jesus laid actually does in verse 15. Verse 15 says that when he had placed his hands on them, he went on from there. And here's what you need to know. Whenever you're reading your Bible, whenever you have access to the New Testament, whenever you see a moment where somebody places their hands on somebody, that is a sign of blessing, acceptance, and welcome. See, see, Jesus doesn't just tolerate kids in the environment. Jesus welcomes and brings them close. Like I imagine that that this large crowd is waiting for Jesus to teach again, and this a group waiting for the meet and greet, and that Jesus gets on his knees and gets eye to eye with every kid and hears about their story. He looks at the mom and the dad and the grandparent or the niece or the aunt or the uncle. He looks at them and he hears about their concerns and their worries for their kid. He hears about the worries that they have about what's going to happen next and the fear they have about the Roman Empire and whether or not their kids are going to make it or if their kids are going to have a, a life worth flourishing. And I believe that Jesus sits there and he listens to every single parent and grandparents and aunt and uncle's concern and that he listens to every little kid's weird story that doesn't make sense that could have been 30 seconds and turned out to be seven minutes. You know what I'm talking about? Where you're like, word economy, right? I think Jesus listens. And then he places his hands on each kid, and he gives them a blessing, and he prays for them. And I've got to imagine that decades later, some of those kids... <laughs> Some of those kids are gathering in house churches, opening up these letters, hearing about a savior who, who defeated death. And they're like, I, <laughs> I met him. I, <laughs> I know him. And those kids are probably the kids that opened up their homes for churches that would be planted around the Mediterranean Rim. And those kids were probably the kids. The kids who, when there were orphans scattered about, brought them into their home. And those were the kids who one day became adults who sacrificed their very life because they met Jesus. You see, Jesus never avoids. He always engages. And it's easy, isn't it? to avoid things and people we don't get. It's easy to look at every generation and say, I don't get that music. All they're doing is mumbling and the words don't make sense. I don't get those outfits. It seems like you went into a dumpster and put some things together. I don't understand this version of parenting. We're raising soft and weak kids. You pick your thing. You know what Jesus would do? You know the tone that Jesus would take? Is that Jesus, Jesus would engage instead of avoid. 
Because here's what's at stake. And here's the question I might ask you. If you're a parent or not a parent, if you've wanted kids or weren't in a place where that was a possibility, what's the faith of the next generation worth to you? Like, think about it. What's the faith of the next generation worth to you? Because kids these days will become adults one day. And they'll sit in our seats. And my hope is that what we would have given them is a tone that would tell them, you've always been welcome here. A tone that would tell them, your questions are welcome. A tone that would tell them, that everything you're trying to explore and figure out and discover, you can explore and figure out and discover right here. Because Jesus taught us to make a way and to definitely never get in the way of kids these days. So we're going to start a conversation over the next couple of weeks that is going to be incredibly practical. In fact, I would say that next weekend's message is massively important because the question you might be asking at this point is, okay, Colin, I know I don't want to get in the way, but how can I make a way for my grandkids or for my kids or for my nieces or for my nephews or or how can I be a part of this? And I think that's a great question that we will jump into next week. And you do not want to miss next week because here's what we'll learn is that helping kids find Jesus isn't as hard as we would expect. It's actually incredibly doable. And not only does the Bible teach us this, but research supports it. And next week, we'll put together a simple plan that everybody can be a part of that at an individual level helps our kids Beat the odds and be the kind of kids that not only meet Jesus, but follow him for a lifetime. And you are not going to want to miss next week. But between now and then, I'm going to invite you to stand. And as you do, I want to ask you one question today, and I want to give you one next step. So here's the question. The question is, what would your tone tell God about what you think about kids these days? What would your words or your tone tell us about what you believe about kids these days? And maybe even a deeper question would be this. Would your tone align with the tone of Jesus? Because here's what I know. If your tone is, "Ah, kids these days, you're already behind the eight ball. You're already behind the starting line and being able to create the kind of environment that can lead to a world where kids meet Jesus. But if your tone is, man, kids these days, there's hope. Because here's the good news is that if Jesus cared about kids in those days, <laughs> we can trust that he's got a plan for kids these days. So here's what I invite you to do. I want to invite you over the next week to really lean into that question. What has my tone been to kids these days? And here's your next step. It's the next step all of us can take. In fact, I want to give you a moment to think about it now. I want to challenge you to pray for one child could be somebody that's in the next generation. could be a family member. could be a friend of a family member. But I want you to make a commitment to spend five minutes every day praying for one child. It could be the same kid every day, or it could be a different kid each day. But here's what I know. When we pray for the next generation, God begins to change our tone 
next generation. And let's let our tone tell the next generation that they can believe in Jesus because Jesus believes in them. And that because we believe in Jesus, we believe in them too. Would you close your eyes with me just for a moment? I would imagine that in a room this size, and for those that are watching online, there is a percentage of us that that find ourselves in a really tricky spot because the way that we've been thinking about kids these days feels a lot more like the disciples than it does Jesus. We've been quick to judge, quick to assume. We've kind of written off the next generation in the way that we speak about them. We've kind of avoided them instead of engaged them. Jesus would invite you today to say, hey, would you take my tone? And so if you would say today, yeah, Jesus, I need to take your tone. I need to take your tone. I'm going to invite you to simply do one thing. I just want you to open your right hand and say, yeah, Jesus, I want to take your tone. Help me do that. And then I just invited you to think about a child or a group of kids that you'll pray for every week or every day this week. And I want us to start us off by doing that together this Sunday. So you have a child's name in mind. And on the count of three, I'm going to invite you to say their name. And here's what's so cool about that, is that we don't hear or understand everybody who says the name at once, but God hears each of them individually. Isn't that amazing? So on the count of three, I'm going to invite you to say the name of the child that God is inviting you to pray for this week. One, two, three, go ahead and say it. Let's pray together. Father, we recognize and acknowledge the stewardship that you have given all of us to invest in the next generation. God, we, we believe today that it's not just about the people that have kids in their home, but it's about all of us recognizing that in the same way that you made a way and that you made it clear that we should never get in the way of kids meeting you. That, Father, it starts with our tone. So would you give us an imagination, a hope and a belief that in the same way you have worked in every generation, you're going to work in this one. That the best really is ahead of us. That, God, you are going to move in power. And that, Father, we might be able to be a part of that story. We recognize that kids these days will become adults one day. And we pray that the message they would hear in our homes, in our workplaces, at our schools, in our church especially, is that, God, they belong, that they matter, and that you have an incredible plan for them. Lord, we love you and we bless you. In the precious name of Jesus, everybody in this place says amen and amen. Let's respond.